see everybody here this morning. Um, if you're a first time guest or if you've never filled out uh, one, we would ask you to fill out a, uh, a guest card. This is your record of, our, of being here this morning, so we can thank you for your attendance. We've got some on the uh, offering box back there, so if you've got a first time guest with you or someone who's never filled one out, you grab one of those. And yes, the offering box is the Back there as well. so, <laughs> I, love, I love having first time guests, and uh, sometimes first time guests become all time guests. I like that. So uh, it's uh, it's interesting. I, I was uh, for our deacons this morning. I was filling out a, a membership uh, chart, just kind of, and I'm like, this is a lot more than the five people I work with. It's kind of uh, to see the growth that God's brought. And continues to bring new people here. It's very exciting. And we have to remember that God brings new people here, not so we can just have more people. God brings new people here so that we can, uh, as the leadership of the church, put them into service of the Lord and engage them in the Great Commission because that's what we're about. We're about taking the gospel. Uh, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not the kind of church um, that is interested in uh, the Sunday morning show. Uh, we're just we're just not interested in that. We don't think that, that is uh, the the purpose of the church. We believe the purpose of the church is for the saints to assemble under the word of God, for the ordinances of the church, baptism and the Lord's supper, and, and for discipline. And we believe the purpose of the church is to be the ambassadorship of Jesus Christ, take the gospel to the dying world. And so, uh, just a little. On our philosophy here, we believe. So, Jeremiah 23 is where we're going to be at this morning. And uh, after not preaching in Jeremiah for the first of our church, I've now preached out of Jeremiah 2 out of the last four weeks. And uh, Jeremiah 23 is where we're going to at. If you need a Bible, we've got some of those as well at the offering box. Um, get yourself in front of the Word of God because it uh, doesn't matter what I say to you, the Word of God is what is going to impact you this morning. And uh, affect uh, the way you, you feel and believe. And so the Word of God is what we uplift this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about the omni omnipresence of God. I get the three omnis sometimes. I'll, I'll get tongue-tied and, and and get those confused. But the, there's three omni attributes of God. As we wrap up the attributes of God this week, we're going to talk about the omnipresence of God it's a third of the omni attributes. The first omni attribute is uh, omniscience, which is omni meaning all, science meaning knowledge, which means God has perfect knowledge. God has all, uh, knows everything, even the stuff that's going on in your mind right now. God knows it. God uh, sees it. Uh, and also we talk about the omni attribute of God being God's omnipotence. Uh, all power means all power is God's. doesn't mean that God just has nothing else. It means that all power comes from him. Uh, by the word of his power, he upholds all of creation in him. We live this. So everything that happens in the universe happens according to the omnipotence. Omnis, omnis being all uh, potence, being power. Of God in all things. And today we're going to look at the third omni attribute, which is <coughs> omnipresence. Again, omni meaning all, presence meaning presence. That's an easy one right there. And not like presence at Christmas, a presence being here in person. Uh, and God is here with us this morning. Um, I, I read interesting stories. I was doing some research for the this week and I talked about an atheist who uh, was teaching his children that God did not exist. And he had a very young child, and he wrote, wrote down on a piece of paper, God is nowhere. God is nowhere. And he was wanting to impart this to his young child, and so he asked his child, yes to me. And the child looks, and looks at it for a second and says, God is now here. And so uh, even the child understood 
that God is very present. Um, and we're going to look at, at that today. Uh, Jeremiah 23, verses 23 to 24. If you've got your Bibles, please uh, open them up there and stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. <coughs> Two short verses are going to kick us off this week. Next week we'll talk about God's love, the attribute of God's love. And then we'll uh, share a couple sermons about the cross and the empty tomb as we get close to Easter. Easter's only three weeks away. Uh, so uh, pretty amazing how fast this year is going. Jeremiah 23, verses 23 to 24. Look with me in the Word of God. Am I a God who is near, declares the Lord, and not a God far off? Can a man hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and earth, declares the Lord? Father, we thank you for your omnipresence. God, we thank you that you're with us. Lord, we thank you for your word. We just pray that it speaks to us this morning, God, that you open our hearts to receive it. Lord, that you impart to us the wisdom and knowledge of you, God, that will change us, that will transform us. Bring us alive. Pray for your honor and your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me see. Then lies. Two, two really short verses this morning. God is asking through Jeremiah some rhetorical questions to the false prophets of Judah. And God says, Am I a God who is near? Well, the answer to that is yes. God is near. We don't serve a God who is somewhere way out in the universe <coughs> who doesn't interact with mankind, who doesn't interact with his creation. We don't serve a God who is far off. We serve a God who is near. And then God asked this question, Can a man hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him, declares the Lord? Well, we already know that God has perfect knowledge. There's nowhere you can go to hide from the eyes of God. There's nowhere you can go. Even to, to go into the recesses of your mind, to hide away your secret thoughts and your secret fears and your secret longings. All those things are laid bare before God. There's nowhere we can go, even into our own minds, that we can hide from God. And then he makes an amazing statement that really sums up the omnipresence of God. He says this, Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord. Do I not fill the heavens and the earth? We think of filling, we think of completely enveloping. We think of completely uh, filling everything, every everywhere that you go. God is there. Whether you go into the the heavens or whether you go into the ground, God is there with you everywhere because God is omnipresent. And let's look at first this attribute of omnipresence. Genesis 16, 13. Hagar, after being told by that she would bear Ishmael. Anybody watched the Bible last week? Um, and I had, a, I had to make a confession on Facebook. How many of us watched the first hour of the Bible and then watched zombies for the next hour? Okay, listen, we're not going to, this won't be confession time. So, um, And then somebody asked the question, why I don't watch zombies? Well, what about biblical zombies? And that's a whole different, whole different thing. Uh, you have to go on Facebook to find that. So, uh, but th they talked about uh, in the Bible last week, uh, Abram, Abraham, and how God had promised him this great inheritance, and He had promised him this great people that He would have a nation after Himself, that He would have a people after Himself, that God would show them mercy and redeem those people for His good name. And Abram and Sarah, who was very old did not believe that she could have a baby. Did not believe that, as a matter of fact, when the, when the angels of God came to, to tell the good news that Sarah was going to have a baby at 99 or 100 years old, she laughed. And so, uh, but before that, Abram showed his lack of faith by, at Sarah's suggestion, going into his maidservant, uh, Hagar, and having a son so that he would have a line. But that wasn't God's plan. And so uh, God tells Hagar this in Genesis 16, 13. He says, 
you're going to have a child, and his name is going to be Ishmael. And then in 1613, she says this, Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God who sees. For she said, Have I even remained alive here after seeing him? The name of the Lord that's used here is El Ra'ah. El Ra'ah. The God who sees. The God who is seen. The God who is present. That's our God. He's seen and he sees and he's present. We've seen the image of the invisible God in Christ Jesus. Christ is the image of the invisible God. God made flesh. Fully God. Fully man. When you want to know what God looks like, you look at Christ. You look at the life of Christ. You look at the attributes of Christ. You look at the way that Christ ministered to people. The way that Christ loved people. The way that Christ sacrifice because he is holy and the sin debt had to be paid for. Christ is the image of the invisible God. But no man has seen God the Father at any time because God is spirit. God is spirit. And that's why he can be at all places at all times. Well, the first thing I want you to see about this attribute of omnipresence is it's incommunicable. Attributes of God. And in saying that, I'm going to screw a little bit away from you guys, because they've got some flu in their family. <laughs> Trying equitable means. It means that someone has something that you can also share in the flu. Um, but this is an attribute of God that is not communicable. In other words, God can be everywhere at all times and fully God in each place. We can't. Anybody would like to be at more than time, that would make life so simple. A few uh, years, years ago, um, I can't remember the name of it, uh, but it had Michael Keaton in it. And he, what's that? Multiplicity, that was it. And he was making clones of himself. And man, man how funny, because I'd send one to work, you know, I'd send one to do all the, the, the house stuff around, and then David would just sit on the, the line and watch football. That would be so cool. But we can't do that. It just doesn't doesn't work that way, unfortunately. We can only be in one place at one time. Why? Because we have limitations of our physical bodies. God has no sense because God is spirit. And because we can only be in one place at one time, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around it. It means for God to be omnipresent. It's hard to be here and God can be at and still be fully engaged and fully God at each place. But God is. He fills the heavens and the earth. God's attribute of omnipresence is not only incommunicable, it's essential. It's essential. What do I mean by essential? What I mean by essential is that it's part of his nature. It's part of who he is. It's not something he puts on and takes off. It's not that God is sometimes omnipresent and God sometimes chooses to be just in one place. No, God is always omnipresent. It's part of his nature. And it works in perfect harmony with all of his other attributes. With his knowledge, with his love, with his power, with his righteousness, with his mercy. All those things work in harmony with his his omniscience and with his omniscience because in all places he sees all things so I want to put it this way that because God is omnipresent he can be in all places because no that because God is omniscient he knows what needs to be done that God knows what needs to be done because God is omnipresent he can be in each place that it needs done and because God is omnipotent, he can do everything that needs to be done. That's the God that we serve. He's in all places, exercising all power, having all knowledge. God's omnipresence is unique. All other created beings lack this attribute. That means that Satan, the enemy, the devil who is prowling around looking for someone to devour, He's prowling around one person at a time. A lot of us 
uh, feel like we're being attacked by Satan. Well, I don't know if all of us are being attacked by Satan, certainly by his demons. Because Satan is a created being. He used to be an angel all the time. And Satan was the music minister in heaven. <laughs> Years, man, so it's only fair. But, but he fell. He fell. He heard the angels with him. But you got to remember, for all the, the power that Satan has, so you got to know two things about Satan. Number one, he's a created being, so he can only be at a time. Number two, he's the devil is God's devil. In other words, he can't touch you unless God sovereignly allows it for your eventual good and for God's glory. Now, while that's happening, it may not feel good, and you may not feel glorious, but I promise you that God does nothing that is bad. It's essential. Thirdly, God's omnipresence is that is eternal. It is eternal. God, it always is at all times. It's always been so and will always be so. Even before he spoke creation into existence, God's attributes of omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipotence were perfectly existing and working in harmony. Wrap your minds around it. God is eternal in his nature, unlimited in his power, and uncontainable in his presence. Think about this for a second. Because God is omnipresent, every sin that we commit is committed in the presence of God. That's good accountability. That's good accountability. I thought about that as I was preparing this message this week. I thought about, man, how many times do I do things forgetting that God is right there, right in my very midst, and in me, in the person of the Holy Spirit. So doubly true as a Christian, God is the Holy Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, is living inside of you. So those are the attributes of God's omnipresence. Second, I want to look at a couple alternatives to God's omnipresence. These are six Times that are floated out there uh, by the world and by the fallen world system a counter argument to the omnipresence of God. I want to look at a couple briefly this morning. The first concept is that all things, because God, that must mean that God is in and in. It's called pantheism. That God is in all things, and all things are part of God. Everything is a little bit of God. Everything is a God. That's very prevalent in Hinduism and Taoism, and also sects of Buddhism. They would tell you that that table is God, and that <coughs> chair is God, and that you are God, and that the sky is God, and that the leaves are God, and that the grass is God, and that all of it is is God. But that's not the God of the Bible, because the God of the Bible is a personal God. He's a personal God. He is personally at all places, at all times. And understand this. It's not as if God were chopped up into little pieces and spread throughout the universe. A little of him was here, and him was there. No, God is fully God everywhere that he is, which is everywhere. Completely and totally God. God created beings and plants and animals and minerals, and none of those things are worthy to receive worship. None of those things are worthy to receive worship. <laughs> Guys, your, your, your television isn't worthy to receive worship. Your computer isn't worthy to receive worship. Your car isn't worthy to receive worship. Your boyfriend and your girlfriend are not worthy to receive worship. Your job isn't worthy to receive worship. Your church is not worthy to receive worship. Your pastor is not worthy to receive worship. The only one who is worthy to receive worship is God. He's the only one worthy. The God of the Bible is in all things, yet apart from his creation. 
He fills the whole of creation. He fills the heavens and the earth. And yet, his creation does not contain him. God will not be contained. There's a difference between the creator and the creation. So that's the first false concept of, of omnipresence. The second false idea behind uh, to counter this is that God is a universal consciousness or a force. God is not a force. God is, he's a person with, with the world and desires who personally interacts with him. Again, God is a personal God. He's a God you can know. He's a God who, who loves. He's a God who has feelings towards you. He's a God who expresses his desires. He's a God who expresses and makes his plans. He is a God who interacts with his creation. He's a personal God. There's no dark side to God. There's no light and dark with God. He is thoroughly and completely good in all that he says and all that he does. Star Wars may be entertaining, but it's not good theology. Don't get your theology from George Lucas. I'm pretty sure that he's not a Bible scholar. Get it from the Bible. You know, God is who God's word says he is. God gave us his word so that we would know who he was. But you know what the enemy wants to do? The enemy wants to give us an alternative to believe. Because it lessens the glory of God. It lessens the, the character of God. It lessens our understanding. God of the Bible is a personal God. He's not part of the source. He's a personal God. He's omnipresent. Third thing we're going to look at, and we're moving quickly this morning, is the application of omnipresence. What does it mean for us? This is where you want to tune in. What does it mean for us that God is omnipresent? What does it mean? See, we talk about the attributes of God, and sometimes we can get a little uh, lost in the weeds on that. We can get a little uh, disinteresting to us in a sense because we can't relate it to ourselves because some of those attributes are incommunicable. But here is the application of God's omnipresence. What does it mean for you? Every person is here this morning. It means something for you that God is omnipresent. And if you're here this morning, one of two people. If you're watching this message, you're one of two people. If you're listening later, you're one of two people. You're either lost without Christ or you're saved in Christ. One of the there's no middle ground. There's no territory. There's no halfway point. To be almost saved to be almost saved is completely lost. You're either a hater of God, running a hundred miles away from Him, away from His presence, away from His will, away from His salvation, or you're a lover of God and you're bearing the fruit of God and you're pursuing God and you're running to Him, running to His Word, running to His presence, running to worship Him. You're one of those two people. There's no one on the fence. There's not a fence. There's just two paths. There's a wide path that most people are on, and that's the path that leads to death, hell, and destruction. And then there's a narrow path. Jesus said there would be few that find it. Don't be surprised that most of the world has no desire for Jesus Christ. He said it would be so. He said it would be so. The narrow, narrow path of life. So you're on one or the other. But whichever path you're on this morning, and you know which one it is, whichever path you're on this morning, God's omnipresence means something to you. If you're on a wide path, if you're lost, it means one thing. In Revelation 6, 15 and 17, the summation of all things, the haters of God, it means that if you're a hater of God, it will be a day of judgment and a day of great fear. You finally have to deal with God that you have denied or blatantly been at war against. 6, 15 through 17 says this. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us. 
heart of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath for the great wrath has come and who is able to stand you know you might go through life complete yourself doing what you want to do ignoring God thinking life is all about you waging war against him the carnal mind the law of mind is at God you act that way but eventually you're Eventually, there will come a reckoning. The staunchest atheist one day bow the knee and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everyone, everyone will have their sins punished. God is righteous. God is thoroughly holy in all things. And our sins will be judged. Now, the option is you can either pay for them yourself means an eternity in a real little place of hell. Or you can take the free gift of life through Jesus Christ who paid for the people. God so loved the world. This is how God loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That is the option that you have. For the lost, God's presence means that one day we will face Him. Regardless of our belief or unbelief. See, our faith does not add to God and our lack of faith does not subtract from God. God is not an egomaniac. God isn't increased by the fact that you came to worship this morning. You haven't done God any favors. If you came to worship this morning, it was your reasonable service. Because God is worthy of being worshipped. We should be at all times. People on Sunday. We should be in fellowship with them. We should be corporately worshiping with, worshiping with them. But it doesn't add to God. Stroke his ego. It doesn't add to himself because his creation worships him. Jesus said, look, if, if these people don't pray entering Jerusalem, and I can command the rocks, they can cry out for me. For the lost, it doesn't matter if you believe or don't believe, God is still omnipresent. Simply not, does not affect that fact. I, I read a story this week about a Russian cosmonaut who was launched into orbit. The communist system is atheist in its, in its nature. And he said, I'm out see. I see the stars, I see the plants, I see the sun. Do you see God? No. Nope, I'm in space and I don't want to If you take the helmet off, you would have been face to face with him. See, not believing in something does not mean it's not true. doesn't believe it's not true. And God is omnipresent in that he can be ignored but not escaped. God can be, God can be ignored but not escaped. And a lot of people go to life and they feel that God is, is calling them. They know what they need to do. They know they, know they need to repent. They know they need to, to confess their sin and flee to the cross. But they say, you know, I'm too young. I'm too young. I want to live my life. And they hit their spiritual snooze button. You know, I'll go through the motions. I'll go to church. But I'm not going to give my life to God. I, I just, I just hit the snooze button. And maybe when I'm older, you know, maybe when I get to college, then, then I'll trust in God. And they get to college and they go, you know, this is a lot of fun. God's going to ruin it for me. They hit that spiritual snooze button. And then he said, but you know what? When I get married, when I get married, that's when I'm going to get right with God. And they find out what real life is. Right? Married folks, they find out what real life is when the bills start coming in. And you take the balance sheet and you go, one of these things is bigger than the other and it's the bills are bigger than more, more money than money. Is he doing things? You say, you know what, God? 
I'm going to hit my spiritual snooze button. But when we have kids, definitely want to get them in church. Definitely want to get them in church. So God, when I, when I have kids, that's that's what I'm going to to get right. That's what I'm going to repent. That's what I'm going to confess my sins and believe on Jesus. And they have kids, and they find out that they got things to do. They've got ball games to go to, and they've got ballet recitals, and they've got tons of things, and there's just there's so much stuff that needs doing. Who has time for God to hit the spiritual snooze button? Maybe when our kids grow up. Maybe when we retire. Maybe right before we die. See, God can be ignored, but he can't be escaped. He can't be escaped. Atheists like to pretend that God doesn't exist, hoping somehow that will make him go away. It's kind of like pretending, we're coming up on tax time, it's kind of like pretending the IRS doesn't exist. It might make you feel comfortable for a while, but eventually the painful reality will sink in. That letter in the mail, or you get that knock on the door, and all of a sudden the guys with the van start taking the stuff out of your house. That doesn't work on earth. And it, why should we think that it works with God? Lord, if I just if I just hit the snooze button, if I just pretend you're not here, if I just pretend I'll deal with it later. God's still there, seeing your life, taking count of your sin. Jesus said every idle word that we speak. Think of the things you've said in the last week. You're going to have to give an account for those things. Everything that you do, you can pretend God's not there, but God is there. And he's watching. And he's calling you. Repentance. God can be ignored, but he can't be avoided. And finally, he can't be contained. God cannot be contained. For the lost person, you might think that the idea of a, an omnipresent God is, is not comfortable for you. Most people are not comfortable with the idea of an omnipresent God. That's why they have idols. They want a God they can see and feel and touch and move and control. God, they can grasp. God, they can understand. Guys, the God of the Bible will never be able to remind around. If you could this God, he wouldn't be God. See, we can know some things about God. know his attributes, but his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. You'll never be able to track this God down. John Bazzano said this, Most people are not comfortable with an omnipresent God. That's why they idols. They want a God they can see, feel, and touch and understand. A God they can control. A God made by their own hands. But you can't fully understand the God of the Bible, and you certainly can't control Him. See, some people think that when we come to the church, we worship here because this is where God lives. I had a friend who took her children to the church. They were excited coming back. Why so excited? Because that's where God lives. We want to, we want to go back and see God. And it's, it's childish understanding that some people never grow. In our southern Bible Belt culture, there's this idea that you can go and be with God on Sunday, but God has no idea what you're doing Monday through Saturday, and that's just not true. You see, we think we come to church on Sunday to worship because it's both the nature of the church and the nature of God. Sunday morning worship is a pep rally. It's a Super Bowl. It's not manipulation against the world. It's not an injection, an infusion of excitement in your life so you can be close to God on Sunday and Sunday goes Monday and Saturday. But if you can only say again, boy, you can worship and get another quick fix. And that's not what church is at all. No Sunday morning at all. So Sunday morning reflects your walk with Christ Monday through Saturday. How you worship this morning, how you tune into the message of your life doesn't say something about how exciting we are or how the music is, which it is. 
for how fantastic the preaching is, which it's not. It doesn't say anything about that. It says something about you. It says something about where you are in your walk with Christ. See, God is in all places, at all times, in all power. Therefore, we should worship and we should obey Him in all places, at all times, and with all our strength. He's not an idol of wood. He's not an idol of stone. on some, in some shrine, living God, the mighty King of the universe. He is real. He is alive. And He is worthy of our praise every second of our lives. Every we go. When we say that God is not worthy of our worship in school, that God is not worthy of our worship at work, that God is not worthy of our worship when we're with our friends, of our worship when we're at our homes, and we say that He is worthy of worship on Sunday, His worth of worship anywhere. Everywhere that you are, every place, and every time, because God is fully in every place and at every time waiting. For your worship. Worthy of it. God cannot and will not be contained. This morning, know that. Know that. God sees you. God is with you. God is everywhere. One day you're going to have to deal with it. If you're saved, it's a completely different outlook on the omnipresent. I love what Martin Lloyd Jones said. This is the fundamental thing of all that we're always in the presence of God. For the sake to know that is omnipresent is perfect. Presence is perfect. 28 20. The second half of the Great Commission is Jesus said. Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And then Jesus says this, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I love that Christ ends the command of the Great Commission with a promise to be with us, through us, to fill the mission through us. It's the perfect presence of God. See, as a Christian, you don't hate the idea that God is with you all the time. You love that He's with you all the time. Why? Because it gives us a sense of presence, but it's perfect protection. 23rd Psalm. Probably the one passage in Scripture other than John 3.16 that most people know. 24 says this, even though I walk through the valley of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, for a sheep, to be able to say that about his shepherd, his pastor, that's what pastor means, shepherd. That valley of the shadow of you know what that means? It means that he's going to walk through some dark places. But he's going to know that the wolves and lions He's going to know that he's going But he's going to know that his shepherd is bigger and stronger than anything that might attack. He has peace. Why? Because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. See, the rod and staff are devices of correction and protection. Christ, our good shepherd, will make sure to keep us from harm and to keep us on. See, to know that God is omnipresent means that he has perfect presence and perfect protection over as you're never going to get into a situation that God's not with you. You're never going to get into an emotional heartbreak that God's not with you. You're never going to suffer a physical infirmity that God's not with you. You're never going to suffer from a finance problem 
or a relationship problem, or a school problem, or a work problem, that God is not with you. With you. I know if you're like me, sometimes we feel like we're on the backside of the desert and no one knows where we're at. We're struggling with things we don't want to tell people. It's hard to pray because when you pray, you feel like your prayers bounce off the ceiling. And God says, in those moments, in your loneliest moments, in your most troubled moments, I am with you. I'm with you. Perfect protection. Finally, we'll close. Perfect peace. To be saved, it means perfect presence. Perfect protection and perfect peace. Psalm 4 8. I love this. Listen to the psalmist. Psalm 4 8. In peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. I go back to the 23rd Psalm. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. You know, sheep, there's a few reasons that the Bible calls sheep. Number one, sheep are some of the dumbest animals that God ever created. Okay? And do we do dumb things? Yeah. yeah. Some of us do the same dumb things over and over and over again. Uh, that's what a sheep does. Sheep are, are really in a herd, easily agitated with each other. And sometimes the shepherd has to come and take that staff and, you know, separate the disagreements between the two of them. Straighten them out. Sheep are lazy. Well, I typify that. I've been a really good sheep. You know, sheep are lazy. Sometimes they'll they'll go to you know the grass is always greener. A sheep will go to the greener pastures, and sometimes they'll they'll lay down because sheep get get uh, irritated real easy, and they will uh, they'll lay down on their back. And, you know, they'll, they'll try to scrub their their back because they don't have back scratchers, and if they did, they didn't have opposable thumbs to be able to use them. And, and they'll, they'll get it, they'll wallow, you know, and they'll get in a rut. And sheep will get so fat, they'll get in this rut, and literally they cannot get back up. They cannot flip themselves over. And so the shepherd has to go, and well, there you go again. You, know, you got fat on me, and you, you know, and he'll pick them up, straighten them back out. But you also need to know this about sheep. They're skittish. Skittish. What do I mean by skittish? I mean, it doesn't take any. You can snap around the sheep, and it will freak out. Sheep get afraid of anything. Sheep even get afraid of other sheep. Sheep are just real easily scared. And when the 23rd Psalm says, you make me to lie down in green pastures, do you know how difficult it is to get a sheep to lay down and be still? Because they're so skittish, to lay down means that they have absolute and complete confidence that their shepherd is watching them and protecting them. Anybody ever wrestled with sleep? Anybody ever wrestled with a, a situation or a relationship in sleep? It's not restful. It happens to sheep. The only way that sheep will lay down and be still is they know the shepherd is watching them. They know the shepherd is near them. They, they know that he's present. They know that he's near them. They know that he will protect them and give them peace. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O oh Lord, make me to dwell in safety. God, I'm present. Here, he's here this very morning. here because he's God. You're either lost and separated from God. You've never repented of your sins. You've never turned from your sins. You've never turned to Christ. You've never believed on Christ. Or you have. You have. If you're lost this morning, I want to encourage as God draws you to repent of that and repent.
repentance and faith. Turn from your sins. Trust in the Savior. And He will save you. If you're saved this morning, maybe you're wrestling with a problem. Maybe you've got a dilemma. Maybe you're scared because you don't know what tomorrow holds. Don't be God's already there. God's already there. God's already seen it. God's already orchestrated your life perfectly. Nothing happened in your life that God did not orchestrate by a sovereign power. <coughs> I want to encourage you this morning to find your rest in Christ. Find your peace in Christ. Give up what you've been struggling with. Turn it over. Lay it down at the foot of the cross. Let him give you peace. Lay down. As a believer in Christ, my sins are as far away from me as the east is from the west. God, I thank you as a believer by the Jesus to die on the cross for sins. And Lord, all those who come to you in genuine repentance and faith, turn from sins and believe on Christ, believing that he died for them. Believing that his blood is sufficient to cleanse their sin. Believing that he will save them. That God, you will in no wise cast those people out. And that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Father, I pray that you're drawing people yourself this morning. Father, may they before this service with God may turn from their sins and trust in you. They begin to follow you and live lives that bear evidence of their repentance. God, I pray for those that are believers in here this morning. God, that are struggling, that are hurting, that are scared. That they'll be reminded, Father, that you're with them. And in them, in the person of the Holy Spirit. God, I thank you that you never command us to do something. Walk with us and hold our hand. And yes, Father, at times you carry us. I thank you for that. I thank you that you are Emmanuel. You are God with us. You are near. You're as close as our heart beats. In the honor and glory as you're worthy of. Just pray these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Next week we're going to wrap up with our series on the attributes of God by talking about the love of God. And that's going to be pretty, pretty awesome. And also on the back of Bulletin's March is our food pantry month. We've got the list of items. We've got a couple folks that have already given uh, bags of food. Appreciate that. Next time you go to the store, I know the groceries are through the roof. You can just pick up another dollar or two, one item, two items, and just bring it with you. Uh, either Wednesday night to Garcia's, Thursday night to the Ogden's, and Sunday here in service. We'll get those in before the end of the month, and we'll take those to the Baptist Association. Also, speaking of the Baptist Association, it's not on your calendars yet, but just so you know, April 9th, which is a Tuesday night, uh, they're having a dental clinic at the Association. It's a great time for people of the community who cannot... Uh, normally get care to come and I'm not sure what all they're doing. I think it's uh, simple cleanings and, and maybe even some fillings or extractions. I'm not sure what all they're doing, but needless to say, there's going to be a lot of folks there who are unchurched. Uh, there's going to be a lot of folks there who need to hear the I'm along with a couple other churches to send folks and talk to these people and witness to them and share the gospel with them. So I'll be there and if you'd like to be there and, and we'll catch up to speed on your witnessing Training in April uh, 9th. So just mark that down in your calendar. There's a couple of things going on too that I can't think of right now. But get on the table. If you're not on the table, send me an email or find me on Facebook and we'll get you an invitation to that so that you can be.
Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming.